and again. How many know that the name of the Lord is a strong tower? And the righteous run in and are safe. Join in with me and sing this little praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. That's all it is to it. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, most high. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is, come on, a strong tower. The righteous run in, and they are safe. They are safe. Hallelujah. The name of the Lord is. A strong tower, the righteous run into it, and they are safe. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, stand up. Blessed be the name of the Lord, most high. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. The name of the Lord is a strong top. The name of the Lord is a strong top. The righteous run into it. The righteous run into it. And they are safe. They are safe. Hallelujah. The name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in. They are safe. One more time. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, most high. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, most high. Do you believe it? Yes. Do you really believe it? Amen. Truly, I believe it. I thank God for his goodness, his kindness, and his mercy. Let's go before the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you on this evening. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness, and your tender mercy. We realize that without you, we would be nothing. Without you, we would fail. But it's in you that we live, we move, and it's in you that we have our being. We ask that you would search our hearts on tonight. We ask that you would bless us on tonight as we hear your preached word. Every song that we sing, every word that we hear, we let everything be done to your will and to your glory. Yes. We ask that you would heal bodies right now. Lift up even every hung down head. Encourage the discouraged. Give victory, Lord, where there's been defeat. In the name of Jesus, we come for no other reason than to lift you up. We come for no other reason than to give you praise. We magnify you. We delight ourselves in you. Yes, All that we need is in you. Yes, Lord. Without you, we would be nothing. Without you, we would fail. Yes, Have God. your way in this place on tonight. In the name of Jesus. Look down on our shepherd, Lord. Look down on all of the people of God everywhere. 
In the name of Jesus, have your way in a special way on tonight. And we'll give you glory, we'll give you honor, and we'll give you praise. And all of God's people clap their hands and say amen. Sister Elliot, since I don't have my glasses, I'm going to ask that you would give us a scripture on tonight. Just Psalm something, Psalm something. Blessed be the name of the, the Lord. Lord. Blessed, Blessed be, be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. I will be reading from Psalms 100. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. May, a, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearing, doing, and reading of his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's real, real. Jesus is, is real, real to, to me. me. Oh, me.
blessings for all that you've done. We say thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. Come on and do what you say. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 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 We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Beloved, before you take your seats, will you quickly, quickly go to someone you do not know, have not seen in a while, say hello, introduce yourself if you don't know them, bless them in their life, encourage them in their journey, tell them how much the Lord loves them, to all of our friends and first time guests that have connected to us through Ustream, we're delighted to have you in the house of the Lord. Where the saints are fellowshipping and the glory of the Lord is in this place. May you be so encouraged and so enlightened as we worship. Hallelujah. I just want to thank. 
Thank you, Lord. I just want I just to want thank you, Lord. Oh, I, I just want to just want thank, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. Hallelujah. 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 What great energy is in this room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Thank God for you. Thank God for Mother Wise. She looks good, doesn't she? I usually go over and sit on her lap. So why not? You notice how we do. Don't be rejecting me now. <laughs> I love the mothers of our church and the, the elders, the fathers of our church. Such a, a wonderful, wonderful blessing. God bless our church mother. I'm going to tell her like she tell me, okay, don't go away that long no more. <laughs> She's on a wonderful family reunion. We're delighted, her and her family, to see you back. And I, I know you had a wonderful time. Beloved, um, I need to do a couple of things. And I need to do them in quick order. If I teach what, a, what what's inside me, we're going to be here till tomorrow night. Y'all game? You're going to have to teach a little bit tonight and then the rest of it the next time. <laughs> Mothers is such a realist. No, I love the word, but we're going to get a little tonight. And we're going to get a little tomorrow night. But we ain't getting it all tonight. Let me try to teach the introduction of it. Um, because I want to hear the praise reports. I, people have been blowing up my phone. God, has this been a season of God's amazing? So we're going to just try to get as many in as possible. Um, and then I want you to, you that um, care to share and will allow us. Now, first of all, I need to tell everybody, you know that we're streaming over the World Wide Web. And so Sunday when we were talking to some first-time guests, they were saying, thank you so much for streaming because I live in Tucson, Arizona, and I watch your broadcast before I go to church. There are people in California that are watching us all over the nation. Now, I'm not saying we're in 52 states, but I'm telling you that we're in at least 15 that I know of. And so we welcome our viewers. Why is that important? Because um, I want you to know that um, we're streaming. So some things in your praise report, you've got to condense because we can't have the details, right? You know, it's the categories. I grew up under an old preacher, Elder Chillis, Eurice Chillis. Elder Chillis used to say, hit the high points, glory. <laughs> he would sit in that chair, you know, and they'd be rounding on. You know, and then I went around the corner and then, you know, well, you know, saying somebody, my daughter called me and then, you know, she said, he was like, hit the high points glory so because we have a lot of people who want to share in the amazing this season of God's amazing and God's surprises I want you to hit the high points 
you know, just talk about it and say, the Lord surprised me with. And then, or, you know, if you want to share that or in the category of, you get what I'm saying? And then keep it moving. All right. But what I want you to do is if you're interested, um, we need some people that will allow us to videotape your praise report. And we're going to do it on an iPad or a phone. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to upload it to our website. And on our website, because we've declared that the season of God's amazing, they'll click a button and they'll hear your testimony. And you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be witnessing to the world that what God is doing in Marietta, he can do in their life and in their city. So if you're interested in doing that, Sister um, um, Bass, Curtis Bass, stand up. Brother Wesley, stand up. Elder Justin, stand up. Sister Sharon, stand up. And y'all know that Sister Sharon, when she's in this position, she is actually broadcasting our services. She's posting the preaching. So she's she ain't on a Facebook plan. She's been doing this since she got here. Posting the preaching. Posting the prayer call. She has a unique gift to hear and retain like I've never seen. And so please talk to any four of these persons and they will set up a time because I really want to post this. I want to tell the world what God is doing from emanating from our local church, all right? The blessing of the Lord be upon you. Now, let me try 15 minutes. Here we go. Second Timothy chapter 3. I want to... I, we were sharing in the preacher's class on Sundays, um, in our Sunday school class, I told them that I want them to begin to look at these three terms. And even in their preaching in the month of August, I want to hear applications of these three things. Because this is, while this is the season of God's amazing, you are seeing, one, one more thing, you are seeing the issue in the Middle East has not been resolved, but it has gotten worse. Israel is bombing Gaza, taking out power plants, and they ain't playing. They're like, we ain't coming back. So they're looking for tunnels, all of it. Kids are dying. People, thousands of, of Palestinians are dead. And, and a couple, of, not even a hundred yet, I don't think of Israelis are, but it, it doesn't matter. The point is people are dying. Putin is continuing his aggression on the eastern part of the Ukraine. And no matter what the world has said, the European Union, the United States has sanctioned him. They're trying to literally disrupt their economy. Um, he continues in defiance. And so um, now the latest thing is that 600 people and one American who was on his way to, uh, one American who was in West Africa on his way to America died of the Ebola virus. Now, two doctors have already died that were trying to treat people. Now, do you remember the Bible talks about plagues in the land? Jesus talks about in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars, right? There's going to be earthquakes and there's going to be plagues and pestilence. That's the word, pestilence. Now, I want you to watch this. I'm not suggesting that's going to happen, but I am suggesting that the great, there's a great potential for somebody, because this Ebola virus, it, it rests in your system for how long, uh, Sister? Uh, okay, it, it, they said for about 14 to 21 days where you're not showing symptoms. And then all of a sudden you're sick and you're so sick you die. And it is highly contagious. If it hits a major urban center, then it spreads. Do you remember MERS? MRSA? Was it MRSA? Yeah. You remember how that, how they were quarantining, quarantining people around that particular issue? I'm just trying to tell you that if you begin to look at what's happening in the world, the stage of the signs of the end, it's just that we don't have the full deck of cards. Let me use that metaphor. But we've got cards. We don't have the full deck, but we've got enough cards for it to paint a story. Are we here? 
And so that's why God has called us to be intercessor to the world. So now I need to use that as a backdrop for what I want to share. So these three terms, and you can look them up and do your own study on them, and uh, missionaries, lay people, because you never know who I'm called to speak. Amen? So be ye also ready. Touch somebody say that means you too. Oh, I ain't a speaker. No, yes, you are. You just don't speak publicly, but you are. And when I get done with you, you will be. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Watch this. Um, it is, it is uh, traditionalism or pre-modernism. It is modernism and post-modernism. Don't get frightened by if the words sound like, what's that? Don't be frightened because they're real simple. It's traditionalism, it's modernism, and it's post-modernism. Say with me, traditionalism, modernism, and post-modernism. I'm going to show you this in a series of teachings on Wednesdays, how we walk through this in Scripture, all right? But the concern that I have and the concern that the father, that the early church fathers had and the, the concern that I think is in the body of Christ now from apostolic leaders is where the crisis to the church is about post-modernism, this age in which we're living right now. And it's, it's the biggest concern because this is, the, this is the place of apostasy. You remember when I laid this out last week, that apostasy is not necessarily letting go, it's just hanging out? You've loosened your grip where you were holding on to God's you know, unadulterated word and it was the truth of God and it was just the absolute. Now all of a sudden, modernism says, well, well let me think about it. Let, let me bring my educated, and I'm, and I'm not throwing off on education. I'm just saying my enlightened mind, let me really see if that's what God is saying or is that somebody else saying it, and I just got to figure out how I feel about it, right? That's modernism. When I filter the word, the absolute truth of God's word through my human intellect and I begin to rationalize how much of that is applicable to me, right? That's modernism. Sister Anne, postmodernism is when my truth and your truth is the truth. One more time. Postmodernism is my truth, your truth, your truth. Everybody's truth is truth. So as a result, it has nothing to do with what we believed in traditionalism. And don't hear the word traditionalism meaning traditional culture of church. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about traditionalism of the scriptures, of the Holy Bible, of what God has said in his word that should not be leveraged, it should not be altered, but that's what we're going to call traditionalism or pre-modernism. Okay? Before modernism happened, there was a pre-modernism. So pre-modernism, modernism, and post-modernism. Now, I need to tell you that there are two different definitions. There's a theological and biblical definition of all these things, and then there is just really uh, the definition that you're going to get out of Wikipedia and wherever else, that it really moves with the Industrial Revolution. You know, it, it, it walks you through time. When, mo you know, like the... the, 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 the the Pan Am exhibition in 1901, the, the whole discovery of electricity, you know, that's the modern society. Then a postmodern society came after the Industrial Revolution. And so you'll see those definitions. Know that your pastor is dealing with the biblical theological issues of modernism as it relates to the church. Are we good? I'm trying to make sure that, ev does everybody understand what I just said? If you don't understand, be like, what in the world are you talking about? Raise your hand. No, I need to know. What in the world? Because I need to make sure we're connecting. Because this is very, very important. Because I'm going to explain to you in some very layman's terms, but I need to give you, I need to give you the foundation first. All right? So, let's, let's read the Word of God. I'm going to read out of the new, new live, the new Living Translation. And it's the dangers of the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm only going to read verses 1 through 5. So it says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. 
They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through five is the introductory statement of this post modern age. It is the apostle Paul telling his young um, apprentice in the gospel, Timothy, he's saying, listen, Timothy, first of all, your name has this implication that you're timid. He says, but now you got to grow up because I'm about to die. I'm about to leave the scene and you've got to step up and stand up. You got to man up. So he says to Timothy, you got to man up because this is what you're going to be facing in your day when you minister to the rest of the world. And so you're not going to face what I face because I face direct direct persecution because he advanced, the Apostle Paul advanced the gospel of Jesus Christ to to the various parts of the world. So he says, but this is what you're going to run in. You're going to run into that difficult times are going to happen. Last days. Now, can you imagine if he wrote this many years ago, do you see this today? No, if I read this, you would think somebody was living today and wrote this. This is the beauty of the word of God, that God had already predicted. He had already foreknew. So he says to Timothy, this is what's going to happen. So now I need to say to the believers in this room and that are watching us over the over the world wide web, don't get messed up when these things happen to you and you see these things happening because the apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, has already told us these are the times we're living in. I was in the barbershop today and uh, I carried a conversation I was having earlier this afternoon with someone and um, I, I carried it into the barbershop. And, and did somebody say, that's funny? You see, that's my problem around here. You just can't just, you can't just be honest. You just, you just can't be, just Gail, you just can't just, you know, talk. They said, using the barbershop, how long did that take? Two minutes? Boy, see, you know, this is a ribbon church. Y'all will crack on somebody in a heartbeat. But y'all do it real saintly. You just snicker and put your head down. <laughs> like I said. I, I was in the barbershop. So, <laughs> so as I was going through the, the drive through um, what... <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> um, I, I raised the question in the chair about is there such a thing as an authentic relationship? Well, it took off like wildfire because based on their perception, they had a whole bunch of opinions about authentic relationships. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, he is suggesting that there is no authenticity in the world and there is no authenticity in relationships and with people. So that's why church people can't get upset when you see people being who they are. You have an expectation that they're going to be godly, but they're just religious. Because they have no, they have moved away from the pre-modern, they've moved away from the authentic truth of the word of God. Now this is not everybody, but I'm just telling you, I'm talking about more of the rule than I am the exception to the rule. When we're talking about why can't we get together and how come folk don't get along and blah, 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 and all the internal issues and external issues, both within yourself, within your family, within your community, and within the world, it's because we have moved away from the authentic truth of the word of God, where God said, this is what this is, and we said, yes, Lord. Now it is not, we question God. Matter of fact, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and watch this and lean what? Lean not to our own understanding. Well, if we did that, then we would cancel out the whole effect of modernism, thinking, questioning, leveraging, trying to see what God really means. That would go out the window if we would just do that scripture. Are are y'all with me? 
Okay, so, um, the, so, so this, this pre-modernism or traditionalism, he is saying, Timothy, here's your problem. Your problem is that you're preaching and teaching and pastoring churches where people now have to take in their own truth and said that their truth is the truth and the truth of the Bible, the word of God, is not true. Okay, y'all ready for another term? You ready? Say with me, emerging church. So this is what he, he's really saying. There's going to come this emerging church. If you look up the definition of an emerging church, it is really a church. It's a movement now that takes a little bit of Protestant. It takes a little bit of evangelical. It takes a little bit of mainline religions and it kind of throws them all together in one big stew. It really doesn't do a whole lot of stuff on tradition, sacred stuff. But, you know, it's really about mystical. It's kind of metaphysical physical, it's psychological, it's philosophical, and I want to see whether it really, you know, if it meets my need, then I'll take it, but I'm not going to sacrifice. There's no sacrifice. There's no doctrine of sin. There, there ain't none of that. Because the emerging church just says we want everybody to be comfortable. The emerging church says we're going to take you as you are. Now, here's, here's my, my take on take you as you are. You can come in here as you are. See, I don't think that, and here's our problem with the, with the church, in particular the Church of God in Christ, that we have messed up folk just walking in. So we want to change how they look coming in the door before they ever met Christ. I'm convinced that you can come in here any way you want. But if you really want a relationship with God, you won't leave the way you came in. And watch this, and watch this, and you can't stay the way you are. No, you can come in. Come on in as a drunk. Come on in. Matter of fact, come on in sloppy drunk. Got no problems with that. And then when you leave here, go take another drink and come on back. Because I got too much testimony growing up of people who were drunk and came to church and the power of the living God got a hold of them and they got sober in the service. Come on with your cigarettes. I ain't going to tell you to put them down. Matter of fact, you just can't smoke on the ground. You can't smoke in the sanctuary. But if you need to light it up going home, light it up going home. Just come on back. Because I guarantee you, when you meet my God, he is going to transform your entire life. And God in you is going to be greater than nicotine in you, alcohol in you, cocaine in you. Come on, y'all. We have reduced God to some chump sitting on the throne like he's not big enough and great enough and strong enough to handle my stuff. I'm here to tell you God can handle your stuff. You are not that big. You ain't that bad. You haven't gone through enough life. God can handle it. God can handle your brokenness. He can handle your thievery. He can handle your criminal record. He can handle your broken relationship. He can handle your heartache, your heartbreak. God can handle anything. Is there anything too hard for our God? And we at the church have got to reclaim our prophetic voice and say, bring it on because our God can. If God can tell a prophet to speak to the sun and tell the sun to stand still. If God can tell the prophet to throw a stick in the water and make an axe head swim, can our God do anything if we say this is what God will do? Come on, touch three people and say, take the limits off. Take the limits off. Stop telling people they got to clean up before they come to church. No, let them come as dirty as they are, as broken as they are. That's the problem with our church. It's too clean. Ain't no, ain't no Newports on the altar. Ain't no Coos on the altar. Ain't no Coke 45 on the altar. Ain't no hookah pin on the altar. Come on, they got issues. And God wants to meet you where you are. He wants the, the dirtier, the better. 
Come on here. The blacker, the cleaner he can make you. He can take a black soul, dip it in red blood, and make you white as snow. Only God can do that. He says, he says, in the last days, he says, this is going to happen because they moved away from the authentic word of God. Kind of made me nervous because I was talking in the shop and then the, 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 the hairstylist was like, hey, pastor. Because when I walk in, they say, hey, Rev. I'm like, hey, what's up? <laughs> Matter of fact, she was braiding some dude's hair and he said, hey, can you leave your card? And guess what? I have a card on me. Because I wasn't thinking. They're all out the car, so I got to restock. But the point was, I said, he said, where do you minister? I said, right down the street, right here. Come out. Come, I'll show it to you, right here. Gave him, you know, because you know what caught him? Was the fact that I was saying that there's no authentic relationship other than a relationship with God. Now, I'm not, I haven't thought this whole thing out yet, y'all. So y'all can think with me and let me know your thoughts. But this is what I think. I think that authenticity... It's got to be vested in a person that says, um, Mother, I love you no matter what you do or do not do for me. That your response to me is not going to alter my authentic love for you. But that's not how people are. Because people got to have something. You see, the thing is, what, what brings us together? So here's the real question. Are, are, you, are you really authentically in the body of Christ? Or are you just a member or a visitor? Or like I like Pastor Tiggs' piece, are you just a fan of greater community? Because the real issue is, what happens if greater community or your job or your relationship in your home, you know, or your friendship, you know, you loan somebody some money and they didn't pay you back. So your friendship breaks up because they violated the trust issue. Well, guess what? There was no authentic friendship to begin with because it was forged by something else. That's why I said I could be here all night on this. Now, I'm going to be, I'm going to get here because this stuff is bubbling inside of me. Because because you know what it challenges me to say? Lord, is my relationship with you authentic? Or am I like Job? Am I just here because you bless me? So what happens if you decide to turn my fortune? Am I walking out? Am I leaving you? Am I saying that you forsook me? That, you know, forget you, God, because you didn't deliver on the thing you promised? Or am I authentically in? Now, can I help y'all with this? Watch this. Authenticity has accountability. It has absolutisms in it. So the only way you can determine whether somebody is authentic is that they are absolutely sold out to that principle that, that they're saying, I'm committed to this no matter what else happens. So, you know, you're on your job and everybody's friends on your job and all of a sudden we have family on the job. You ain't no family because the minute you tell one of them that they're fired. Then all of a sudden there's a problem in the family. Ain't nobody talking to me. Right. Because you just you don't stop talking to them. You know, come on, I'm, I'm just can I, can I just be real for a second? I, you know, I got to tell it all ministry. Part of my struggle is that um, my fr- uh, friends of mine or people that I know uh, are here from around the country for um the gospel music workshop. And, and so I've had the opportunity to spend some time with some friends I haven't seen. Right. But it dawned on me while I was driving away. Um, wow. It took this. So now I'm questioning all the years that I poured in and invested in and, and supported and sacrificed and shared and took the shirt off the back and nothing. I'm saying to myself, was this only because we were just in the same church? We were in the same city. But now that I move, the phone ain't ringing. I'm just, I'm just being real. Right? And don't need nobody to call me, so don't feel, don't feel sorry because that's not the issue. I'm trying to make the point that maybe a lot of stuff that we're in and that we're involved in, is only situational and it's not really authentic. And what hurts us is when we run into the reality of its inauthenticity. 
So some people call that church hurt. I went to that church and I was broken and I thought they loved me. Right? And then I acted a fool and somebody called me on it and then they put me out. That church ain't got no love. No, you acted a fool. Are you here? So now the church hurt me. No, the church didn't hurt you. You were inauthentic when you walked in the door. Because you were purporting to be something that you were not. Thinking that you needed to be that so other people could accept you. Instead of saying, man, I'm broken in some spots. I got some stuff that I'm working on. I'm not all the way there. And watch this. And we love you knowing you're not all the way there. Are are we here? See, if we would at least learn, first of all, to be authentic ourselves. So so what, what, what Paul is saying, man, I'm over my time. What Paul is saying is, he's saying, look, he says, you're going to be preaching to inauthentic people in a postmodern era because they've already thought about it and declared that they're smarter than God and they have walked away from absolute truth. Where the word is not the word anymore. The Ten Commandments are ten suggestions. Come on here. Oh, no, no, that was for that day. That's not, that, that just because it doesn't fit into the way I live today. Oh, man. So let me give, give, let me give you this piece and I'm going to stop. Um, so there, here's our problem. If everybody's truth is truth, and I couldn't find the scripture before I came out because I got sidetracked with some other stuff. Y'all know, somebody tell me where that scripture is where it says, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Yeah, that's what I want. Flip the pages, flip the pages. Flip the pages. Because you know what you're going to stop doing? You're going to stop relying on me to cite chapter, verse. You're going to flip that. I grew up in a flipping pages church where we brought our Bibles to church. Yeah, right. Judges what? Judges 21, 25. Read. I just Google. Hold on. (laughs) Come on, come on. Hold on, I, I want to do like the old preachers. Read. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Let me share with you that this could be a demarcation, a scriptorial point. So preachers, missionaries, Bible students, theologians, get this, where postmodernism begins. Could be. Not suggesting that it is. So let me give you the, the framework. You, you all have heard of the seven dispensations, right? Okay, so in the seven dispensations, the word of God is broken up into seven distinct periods. So it's innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom. We are currently living in the dispensation of grace. So when grace is over, the rapture occurs, which triggers, come on, kingdom. So think about it. Out of the seven dispensations, the specific areas and times in which God is going to move in the earth, we're already at number six. Oh, okay, so it's innocence. This is, in the, this is in the book of Genesis, where God was coming down. He was created in innocence, right? Then when he sinned, consciousness. I want to say, now I could be wrong because I'm still studying this thing out, you know, but I want to believe biblically that consciousness, that dispensation begins modernism because at that point they became conscious, humanly aware of right and wrong and deciding what they will or will not do. They were enlightened. Are we here? So I told you I'm going to give you the biblical framework for it, right? So it's innocence, that's, in, that's the first part of Genesis with Adam and Eve. When he sins, then consciousness kicks in, right? So we are consciousness. Um, the next one is human government. So that's when families were being formed, Seth and all the... So now we're going through the line of Adam, right? That's, that's human government. The fourth one is Genesis chapter 12. That's promise. That's when God makes a promise to Abram that I'm going to make of you a great nation. All right. So after promise comes grace. That's number five, right? No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I put four. What did I say? Five words. Law. Yeah. Thank you. Law. 
No, hold on, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law. Law is five. Law is five. So here's the lawgiver, Moses. Here's the Ten Commandments. Here is the book of Deuteronomy. Here's the book of Leviticus. Because now we're going to teach you, since we broke the relationship, now we're going to hand you a book of rules and regulations to tell you that this is how God expects you to be. Right? So then the sixth one is grace. Now we find this here in um, uh, St. John. Um, St. John chapter 1. Uh, hopefully 1 and 17. Somebody just... Check me on that. Um, I I think it says, for the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So now all of a sudden at the birth of Jesus, he's ushering in, watch this, grace. How is that? Because he kept the what? Come on, y'all. He kept the what? So Jesus had to keep the law in order to make grace legitimate. Touch somebody and say, you don't have no cheap grace. Yeah, you don't have to. We don't have cheap grace. We don't have, oh God, man, I could run on that. We don't have cheap grace. But Jesus Christ kept the whole law. He kept all the law, right? And so he had to fulfill the law in order, watch this, to go to Calvary to die as the substitutionary person for you and I. And that Calvary's cross is where grace now all of a sudden was ushered in. And so then Paul says in, what is it, Ephesians 2 and 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of works. Yeah, y'all know the scripture. Y'all got it? So now we're in, the, we're in grace. Guess when grace ends? In First Thessalonians, is it First Thessalonians or Second Thessalonians? With wherever the rapture's at, that's where it ends. Because then he cracks the sky and he takes the church out of the earth. And the church is what? Salt and light. So when you take the salt, which preserves it, and let me help you with something. It's bad, but it could be worse if we weren't here. It's dark, but it's going to get darker when we leave. Hallelujah. I posted a thing today about people who are in pain. The people who are in pain right now are searching for God in the dark. They got a hole in their soul searching for God in the dark. But I'm here to tell you that God is in your darkness because watch this. Even in the darkness, you're going to be able to find him because if he wasn't there, it would be pitch black and you couldn't see anything. Thank you, Lord. So anyway, so Jesus is going to come and he's going to usher in the kingdom of what? The kingdom, the dispensation of the kingdom. And then the kingdom goes after the rapture, the tribulation begins, the the Bema seat judgment, the great white throne judgment, all of the apocalyptic eschatological stuff, all the stuff that scares you in Revelation, bam! Game over. So now watch this. Today, when you hear my voice, harden, come on, not your heart. Are we here? So I want y'all to see it. Because I don't want you to think you got a whole lot of time. Because you don't. I don't want you to, yeah. Oh, you just wait. I don't want you to think you got a whole lot of time because you don't. Okay, one more time. I don't think you, I don't want you to believe you got a whole lot of time because you don't. So what's happening in this period of grace? The church is now going through a state of apostasy where it's loosening its grip. It ain't holding on no more. It's just hanging out. We are more concerned with one another and petty issues and, and we're more emotional than we are devotional. We're not full of the word. We're full of ourselves. And this is what he's saying. And this, this is what's going to happen. These are the people you're going to run into. Why? Now, I'm trying to bring this full circle, and then I'm going to stop. Full circle. You ready? Why are we at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5? Because we have walked away from the traditionalism of the word of God, where the absolute word of God was absolutely absolute. And so he says, what happens That when people walk away, they will love only themselves and their money. I'm right back to the text. When people walk away, they will be boastful and proud. Do you realize we have nothing to be proud about? No, one more time. I I know we've got great success and we've got, but you've got nothing to be proud about. Because because the, the thing here is what God has done. No, one more time. It's what God has done. But because we've walked away from traditionalism, it's all about us. 
We will talk about us more than we'll talk about God. We'll talk about what we've done more than giving glory to God. Because we are, it's, we're self-consuming. And this is what he says. When you walk away from the, when you walk away from authentic truth, you will find people who are boastful and proud, scoffing at God, basically saying, "I did my own thing." A great example is the movie. How many have seen the movie The Matrix? The Matrix is this whole issue of what happens in this sort of alter world, right? And then Neo is trying to literally bring them back to the traditionalism, but he's trying, he's fighting in this postmodern world. So that's why your kids, you're telling them about how you grew up and they can't relate to that. You're telling them about how you stayed in church all night, you fast and pray, and then you get all the amens with people in your age group and they're looking at you like you're crazy. Why? Because they're living in a postmodern era where, you know, people don't stay all night. No, we give God a little something and then we out. We got stuff to do. God ain't the only one on my agenda. Because we have moved away from absolute truth. And so he says they'll be lovers, they'll scoff at God, they're disobedient to parents and ungrateful. They consider nothing sacred. Communion's not sacred. The sacraments of the church are not sacred. Feet washing is not sacred. The word of God is not sacred. They consider nothing sacred. And the problem with the emerging church is they boot out all tradition. All tradition of celebration, all tradition, they, they throw that out the window because it's not relevant to their life. Are we here? Nothing sacred. They will be unloving. Here's my inauthentic piece. So you're looking for, you're looking for worldly people who don't know Jesus to love you. How's that working? No, one more time. You're looking for worldly people who don't know Jesus, to love you. Okay, you don't like that one. How about this one? You're looking for religious people who go to church, who don't know God, to love you. How's that working? They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. People who talk about other people, who cut folk down, who backbite, who gossip, who create issues and trouble, who create speculations and all of those things. These are people who have left the authentic word of God. Oh, it ain't ain't no old man, amens now, right? And they have no self-control. Whatever comes up, comes out. Whatever they want, they're going to get. If, if this is the way I feel, this is just the way I feel. No decorum, no respect, no restraint, no hold on, Lord, let me give this. To, no, it's whatever I want when I want it. Because I've become so full of myself. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. So when you get stabbed in the back by somebody you called your friend, it's because you didn't check to see whether or not they were holding on to the authentic truth of God. So they will betray their friends. They will be reckless. And the last thing you want is somebody being reckless with your anointing, reckless with your promise, reckless with your future, reckless with your potential, reckless with your possibility. Oh, man. They'll be puffed up with pride. They'll love pleasure more rather than God. Now watch this. This is a great one. They will act religious. Here's the issue. You cannot believe in God and deny the power of God. One more time. You can't believe in God and then deny the power of God. And the power of God is in the baptism in the Holy Ghost. So you, there's no way you can say you believe in God and you are not filled with the Holy Ghost because that is the power of God in the earth. God was in creation. Jesus was in redemption, but the Holy Ghost is in the age of the church. 
Oh, I'm teaching doctrine. This is straight up doctrine. And I'm preparing you for the faith focus because we're going through the epistle of Paul to the Romans for the entire month of August. You need to be on the prayer call because I'm teaching 16 chapters of Romans in 31 days. Because I'm concerned that we're raising a church that doesn't believe anything. And so I don't know how you lead people who are already leading themselves. How do you do that? When everybody's truth is the truth. Are we here? He says, they're religious, but they reject the power that could make them godly. What power is that? The Holy Ghost. He says, stay away from people like that. In the King James Version says, from such what? Turn away. He says, first of all, you don't need to be with anybody who's denying the power of God. Oh, you don't like that. Well, I need friends. You don't, those aren't your friends. They hate God. How are they your friends and they hate God? Okay, one more time. How are they your friends and they hate God? Now, I'm not suggesting that you can't be around people because Jesus was very social. I'm just saying you can't take them in your bosom. You can't give them the secrets of your heart. You can't expose them to the treasures of God's anointing in you. I took more time than that. It's traditionalism of scripture, pre-modernism, modernism, and post-modernism. The last days, this is where we're living. We're living in postmodern. And guess what? We're in a postmodern time trying to preach a pre-modern gospel to a postmodern generation. You want to know why churches aren't growing? Because we're preaching authentic truth in an age where there's no such thing as authentic. Everything's fake. Man, I I went hard today, but I'm sorry. Everything's fake. That's why, you know, here's my point. Keep it. If the smile ain't real, don't give it. Keep it. Keep it. If the relationship's not real, keep it. Friendship ain't real. Keep. Don't ever feel leverage. To be phony for anybody. Because that's part of the apostasy. Oh God. Has this helped anybody tonight? Wow. This is what I'm going to need to do. I'll get some of them on Sunday. But give me about five people. Who got surprises. Stand up. Well first of all everybody got a surprise stand up. that That you wanted to share it. Stand up. Just stand up wherever you are. Let's, we'll do it this way. Come on. Sister Coney, I want you to come down. So you sit down because I, I want to tell you. Want you, you sit down. Okay, surprises. Now let's, let's, let's shout them out. Hold on. Surprise. Job promotion. Job promotion. $9,000 increase in salary. $9,000 increase in salary. Got my gift Saturday night. He got his gift Saturday night. Somebody knocked on the door and handed him a couple hundred dollars. New new car with a navigation system. New car with a navigation system. I just found God. That's all. That's my that's my biggest thing. He found God. Dismissed. Hallelujah. Woo. Hold on. I receive 
my disability without a lawyer on the first go round. Without a lawyer on the first go round. She received, she received her disability without a lawyer on the first go round. Watch this. And they had to reverse what they initially thought. They initially were going to decline her. She went back and in a matter of prayer meetings, God turned that thing around and blessed her. Permanent disability without fighting. One more. Do you remember the young man we were praying for, Michael Reed? Remember I told you, did I tell you all last Wednesday that I sent the text to them? And I, Okay, well listen, this is what I said. Last week, no, don't do it. Don't say it. Okay, come here. Because I got something else. Come here, quickly. I'm not going to do what you think I'm going to do. Because I'm, I'm too smart for that. Now, let me just tell you what he just told me. No, no, because my point is, I'm not going to let the enemy. No, 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 no. Watch this. The facts of the matter is, corporate, last Tuesday, right? Was it last Tuesday? Was it last Tuesday? Or was it a week or so? More than that. It was a week ago. Got a call that they were gathering to say goodbye. Everything had changed. It, it, it had moved drastically. He had opted to do the, the aggressive piece. We talked about that. Organ failure, organ failure stuff was going on. Corbett went to be with him, got the message. I sent Corbett, did I send you the thing or I sent your mom? I sent one of them a text. And that was the same day that I was teaching on uh, Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, where Joshua tells the son to stand still. And so they, um, they were um, gathering because he was supposed to transition. And I sent a text and I said, I decree the son to stand still in his life. And we went on the prayer call fighting. And if you are on the prayer call, you know, we were holding him up, praying. The nine o'clock church was praying. The 12 o'clock church was praying. Everybody's praying because we're fighting for his life. Now, listen, people get weary because we're not them. And what he just told me was he's just weary. He said he just told the doctors, let me go to heaven. But I'm saying to this, I'm saying that's fine. That's your choice. But while there's still life, we're negotiating with God. So here's here's the here's the text we got right now. He's improving. Oh, so this is what happened. He was supposed to die Tuesday, Wednesday, somewhere in there. He's still living. They took him off the ventilator, off the blood pressure medication. No, he's still struggling. I, I'm not trying to tell you he's healed. But it says right now he's improving off the blood pressure meds and ventilator, daily miracles. Thought he was going to die last Wednesday, but again, it's not as bad as we think. Now, on his side, he's going through it. So we got to pray that God gives him, right, the will to live. Now, I'm not going to pray against his will. But I'm really not even considering him right now because when you're hurting, you don't really know. You just want it to stop. I'm saying, God, you're greater than his pain and the testimony of your glory is at your, it's right here. So what was supposed to happen? That's why I want to tell you, great community, y'all, you rebuke people when they tell you church ain't what, like it used to be. We're mir Use a lie. You need to come to where we are because miracles are happening. God is moving by his power. Sister Blue, stand up. We, we gave her testimony Sunday. Brother Larry, who was diagnosed with colon cancer. And you tell him what you told him. Sorry, y'all. We going home. Hold on. If you no, no, go back. Go back. Go, Sister Blue, go back. If you don't get your lazy tail up, stand up. Ah. 
Uh, last last uh, Thursday, when 9 o'clock prayer, Sister Milton and I, I got a call from Larry. He stated that the doctor had called him because he thinks the cancer is worth. I said, Larry, do you get a call from God this morning stating that the cancer got worth? He said, no, but I'm afraid. I said, you know what? It's going to be all right. I said, it's going to be all right, Larry. Don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. I said, one thing about it. I said, we're praying right now. We're going to pray for you. And just go on and just go to the doctor. And then you call me and let me know what the doctor said. If you want me to, I'll go with you. He said, no, I'll be all right. So I went to the doctor. He called me the afternoon and said, you know what? They don't find anything. There's nothing there. Okay, I, I told Larry, I said, Larry, I said, do you want this cancer? He said, no. I said, well, you tell God you don't want it. He said, God, I don't want this cancer. I said, what do you say? Say it again. God, I don't want this cancer. I said, all right, go into the doctor and come back and let me know what he say. Is there anything? You know, when you hear these testimonies, you start looking at the stuff you tripping over. And you be like, hold on, hold, 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 hold on. Get yourself together. Because if God can do all of that, God can do it for you. This is the season of God's amazing where God is going to continue to surprise you. <sighs> Jesus. So can, can, I, can I give you a little prayer language? And I promise you we're leaving right now. Give me, let me give you this prayer language. Stop asking God to do it. And start saying, Lord, surprise me in this. Because then you release to him however you want to surprise me. Surprise me in this. Surprise me in my health. I know what the doctor said, but surprise me in my health. Surprise me in my bank account. I told you I'm a 97 cent worshiper. Hallelujah. Surprise me in my bank account. Because when you go to God with expectation, he creates an encounter that leaves you with an experience. Were you blessed tonight? Hallelujah. 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 And here's the other thing. Stay away from folk that ain't talking the same thing you're saying. You, you talking about surprises and expectation and they tell them, well, you know, God gave you common sense that, listen, don't believe that. God gave you his word and he watches over his word to perform it. And his word is greater than your common sense. Hallelujah. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. This is what we got to do quick need to receive an offering. You that can and will tonight, the ushers are on the floor. Will you give at least a $10 gift if you can? Give whatever you can. To our first time visitors, you're under no obligation to give. We just simply want to receive your gift with gratitude. And if you choose to share, we'll receive it with gratitude and apply it to the area of our greatest need. Beloved, I want to say to you that there's one thing that I want to happen before while we're doing the announcements. Do me a favor, hold that for one second because I got one thing to do. I forgot real quick. Brother, sit right there and we're going we're gonna to be good. While they're passing out the envelopes. That's my cue. <laughs> Our dinner theater is coming up on August 9th. And here's a commercial from some of the cast of It's All About Love. Oh, what is it? Yeah, that one. Love is all it takes. <laughs> What you doing? Well, come on here. Now look at here. Now they said up there at that church, greater, greater, greater what? Greater community. I believe that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They're having a dinner theater. Who? Yes, I need some food, some chicken. Yes, that good. good, I don't know what it's going to be, but they're having three courses. Oh yeah. But you got to buy us a ticket. A ticket? How much the tickets? Well, my belief 
is they've sold out of the good tickets. You took what? too long. You took too long. I want a good, good seat. Well, they have some tickets for twenty dollars. And you can go online. Uh huh. Wait, like this, like this. Yeah, go online uh-huh. on the computer uh-huh. or at their website. Uh huh. What is it? Greater what is it? Greater Community Kojic. Ooh, Kojic. Like like That's right. That's right. right. Greater good, Community Kojic. Uh huh. Dot org. Yeah. Or I believe they're gonna be selling some at the service. Where we at? At the church. The church. Let's go to the church. Oh, I told go, you. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Tonight, 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 do not leave without your ticket. Members of the cast will be outside to give you your ticket. We're almost at sold out capacity. We've sold out of the VIP tickets. I'm saying to you, this is a wonderful way to invite your friends and family who do not know Jesus Christ. Or if you just simply want a night out, we'd love to have you simply go on our website, get the tickets right outside, and you're going to have a phenomenal time. This is our launching of our evangelism. This is part of our, say with me, social evangelism. Social evangelism means that I'm not bringing you to a religious service. I'm bringing you to a social function so that you can know Jesus. And people will sit and watch a play and hear because you don't know what people are going through and what will touch and trigger and target other folk. Amen. This coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, say with me this Saturday is our home foreign mission four seasons buffet. Four seasons is where food is from the winter, summer, spring and fall. And so it's a buffet. It is $15. And if you would want to be a part of that, please see Sister uh, Stewart or Sister Pittman. Joyce. Sister, stand up, Sister Pittman. Stand up, Sister Joyce. See Sister Joyce Pittman. We need to know. Now, listen, we need to know because we've got to get, we've got to figure this out because today is Wednesday. Amen. And so we want you, if we can get an overwhelming response, we're going to roll with it. We may have to postpone it to later on in the year, but we need to know from you what we're going to do. So please see them tonight. Also, we're praying for Franklin Road. I need that sign. I need a young person to bring me that sign. I said a young person, Mike. (laughs) No, I'm playing. I'm playing. (laughs) Let me tell you what I'm so excited about what's happening at this church that ministries and auxiliaries are taking off like crazy. Our pastor of outreach, Elder Willie Davis, and the outreach team in in partnership with our evangelism team, Franklin Road has had a number of crimes and shootings, and we are now taking God to the streets, Amen. bringing kingdom to community. Amen. On 877 Franklin Road this Saturday at noon, yeah. we will be in prayer. We will be doing prayer walks, and we want you to be a part of this because not only are we going to be at Franklin Road, we're going to also be walking various parts of Marietta walking and praying. They're called prayer walks. We're getting out of this building and we are going to challenge the enemy on his ground. Amen. But this is part, this is a training session. So we want you to be with us at noon on Saturday. And then what time is the home foreign mission four seasons at five? Is it three o'clock? Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause after you get finished praying, you're going to be hungry. Amen? Amen. So we want you to be a part of this. If you can be here at noon, join us at 877 Franklin. Not Don't join us here. And we're rolling over. Meet us on Franklin Road. We've got to get out there so that people see that there's an alternative to the life that they're living. Amen? Amen. God bless you. So we got signs for you. And our church was in the Marietta Daily Journal last week. Sister Davis was holding one of them signs. They wrote a piece on the church coming out praying for the community. And we're going to be praying for kids. Did I get everything? The health, well, the health fair is on the 16th, right? The, is it 16th? Or, August 16th is our health fair. Come on up here quick. It's massages. It's many physicals. I'm trying to remember everything. It is blood pressure screening. It's HIV testing confidentially. It is... A speaker from a Morehouse Surgery, trauma surgeon, is going to talk about um, youth violence and its effects on society and the church. Uh, Dr. Omar Danner is going to come and talk. And hopefully we'll have a woman who's experienced violence at the hands of her own daughter. Hopefully she can come. And if you know, and here's an, this is another part of our social evangelism. If you know somebody who can't get to a doctor, you know their blood pressure is high, tell them our church is having a health fair. You need to come down. It's free screening. And so either the eye people will be here, right? Ophthalmologists, ears, 
Oh, we got a psychiatrist coming, so bring your family. <laughs> bring your family. <laughs> Matter of fact, I need to go home and buy some tickets now. I'll fly them on down. Come on. Bring your family. No, I'm trying to help you. There is so many things. And then the next, on the next day, because this is our health fair, for the, for the third year, we will be holding a blood drive. Now, while we're saving souls up here, we're saving lives downstairs. We need young people this year that are 16 and older. There's a certain weight requirement. We need 100 pounds. We need parents to encourage your young people. Because here's our little secret weapon. I want us to hit over our goal. And we've been, we started off the baseline. We hit, we went over our goal. I want to go over last year's. What was last year's goal? We had 62 pints of blood. Last year, we started the first year at 40 something. What did we do? 40. We did 40 first year, 62 last year. Here's our secret weapon. If we can get kids that are 16 and older to give, and I need you parents to do and give with them, make it a part of how making them civically responsible. All right. That's our bloody Sunday. So that's our weekend. I believe God's going to do great things as we continue to do great things for community. Amen. Now, I can't give this year. I've been giving every year, but, you know, I went to Haiti. So Sister Stewart had them shoot me up with some drugs and with these. Um, I got some of everything in me right now. I don't know what it is. So it take, it take a couple months for it to work through, get settled. But they said, don't be giving no blood. <laughs> so I can't do that because we're going back to Haiti in January. So I want you to please, please, please. Did I miss anybody for August? So we've got... Saturday, prayer, we've got the Four Seasons, we've got next Saturday, the 9th, the dinner theater, you can buy your tickets from the cast tonight, we've got the health fair, we got praise in the park Saturday, praise in the park, but you, that, you, you're locked for that, right, the bus is done, yeah, two seats left, if you want to go, please see Sister Marcia Thompson tonight, if you want to go, otherwise meet them at Piedmont Park, right, Praise in the park. Why WCC? I said praise in the park, right? I said Piedmont. I'm sorry. I'm still trying to live here. Centennial. Where is that at? The second Saturday, nursing home. Okay, so we're going to put all this stuff out. There's so much happening this month. That's why there's no reason why you as members are not involved in your church. You cannot say we ain't doing nothing. We need your help. We're doing a whole lot. The convocation begins on Monday night with the musical, the gospel according to James. It officially opens on Tuesday morning and then Tuesday night is communion. Wednesday night, we will not be here. So we will not be here next Wednesday because of the convocation. Now, let me explain something to you. We shut, I, as a pastor, you shut down for the workers' meeting and the convocation. The departmental meetings, we stay because everybody's not going there, and it's difficult. But it's just a great sign of respect. I'm not going to be holding church while the bishop is calling the diocese together. You just don't do stuff like that. This is why you can't be in authority unless you're under authority. Watch folk that are in authority, but ain't under authority. They don't, they don't account, be accountable to nobody. Amen? So next, to, next week, we're done. The convocation is the official day on Sunday. All right. We got communion on Sunday. We've got choir rehearsal tomorrow night. <sighs> Praise Jesus. Okay, we ready? Let's receive our offering. Let's get our tickets tonight. Let's get with Sister Stewart, get with Sister Marcia. And all of the saints, we're standing in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Do y'all remember when my mother, for you that were here, when my mother at my inaugural banquet said, saints, put on your roller skates, because if he going to be your pastor, y'all going to be working. Right, you figured it out quick, right? Face the outer walls. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time that we share in your presence. Now cause us to recapture authentic truth, even in this postmodern world. Cause us to be authentically yours. Bless thy people. We pray healing and deliverance for your saints. 
We touch and agree for those things that you shall do, not only in our body, but in our spirit and in our mind. I pray that you undergird the brokenhearted today, those who suffer from heartache and heartbreak, from anxiety and anguish and deep sorrow. Heal them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Bring us back at the appointed time, we pray. Amen and amen. Bring the Lord an offering and then consider yourself dismissed in the presence of our God.